Hi, this is our SAT vocabulary list number 13. Please write the word, the part of speech, the definition, and note any examples or root words um, that I might give during the course of this presentation that will help you remember the words. The first word is abstruse, and it describes when you're dealing with matters that are really difficult to understand, either because you don't have the um, maybe you haven't, you know, gone far enough in school to understand them or you haven't studied that particular area of math or English or science or whatever. And sometimes things are abstruse because they're really obscure and hard to understand or the meaning's kind of hidden or things are really like mind-blowing and profound. And this actually comes from a Latin root word that means concealed or hidden. Um, and so if you think about that, if something's really abstruse, the meaning is fairly hidden. Um, you have to kind of dig to get to the bottom of it to really understand it. And so for me, I have all these mathematical formulas and equations, which for me would be very abstruse just because I'm not mathematically minded. Agitate is to disturb, to, you know, to, to be disturbed, to move, to excite. It's a verb. And for me, the word agitate has negative connotations. So I don't really think of good things when I hear this word. Um, and different people are moved or disturbed and or excited by different things. Um, and But if you're feeling disturbed or kind of agitated and excited, um, it doesn't necessarily mean like excitement, like the happy excitement. So I think of a synonym would be something like perturbed, to be perturbed by something. So for me, looking at a classroom in disorder with kids doing whatever it is they want to do and there's um, clearly nobody's listening to anybody, that would agitate me. It would cause me to be unsettled and physically kind of like uncomfortable. The next word is complacent, and this describes someone who is pleased or satisfied with their situation, with their achievements, their merits. They're really content with who they are and where they are. Um, for me, someone is, who's complacent, um, I associate this with someone who just kind of wants to stay where they're at. And so for people who want to constantly be achieving more, um, this may be a word that doesn't have positive connotations. So it kind of depends on your perspective. Um, but for example, here's someone with a trophy, clearly won um, a hockey competition or game or tournament or the season, and is probably quite complacent in this moment, just satisfied with this win and with where they're at. Number four is divulge. And to divulge something is to tell something or make something known that was previously a secret. So if you tell someone, if you divulge something, you tell someone basically a secret that um, they didn't know before. So here's an example of, you know, one friend kind of divulging some information to her girlfriend. Clearly this is, this is a secret because they're very close and it's kind of on the sly that this information is being passed back and forth. Um, but she's telling or making known something that was previously unknown or private. Number five is formidable. And this can describe something that um, is difficult to accomplish. So a task can be really formidable. Your English digital portfolio might feel really formidable as we come to the end of the school year. Um, but for others, a formidable task might be something that causes fear or apprehension, which actually your English digital portfolio might also cause that kind of reaction. Um, but when I think of it about it, I almost think of it as a, a formidable, um, like something to be conquered, something that is intimidating, that might elicit fear, but that, you know, it's like an obstacle that you, that you're going to try to get over. So a formidable task or a formidable obstacle is one that's going to present a challenge. It's going to cause you to maybe have some fear or apprehension. So I have this picture of this gentleman climbing a really tall mountain. Um, I'm pretty afraid of heights, so I know that that would be a really formidable task for me. Inevitable means unavoidable. It's going to happen. There's no way to stop it. So a really good example of inevitable, inevitable is that we're all going to die at some point, right? And in the process, some of us are going to age. There's no way to escape aging. Um, it's inevitable part of life. Number seven is laggard. And a person who is described as a laggard has is falling behind physically. They're behind you. Um, and so you can think of the word lag um, as the one who lags is described as a laggard. So I have a picture of a small child 
clearly tiny little legs can't keep up with the mom um, and so she's a laggard she's lagging behind and if you've ever gone on any kind of walk with a small child um, they race 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 and then very quickly hit exhaustion and then they lag behind and then you know, constantly have to be kind of carrying them or pushing them in a stroller or coaxing them forward negligent describes someone who, one who neglects. So to neglect is the verb form, um, but someone who's negligent is apt to omit what must be done. And apt to omit means they often don't do something that needs to get done. So you wouldn't want a negligent employee because that means they're not doing things that they are supposed to do. Um, you also don't want to be negligent probably in your responsibilities around your house. Otherwise, you could end up with a disaster like the one you see before you. Nine is proceed, and proceed means to happen first, to come before, and so I underlined P-R-E, meaning, you know, like first or before, to come before, just to help you remember this word. And so when I think of the word proceed, I think about a line, you know, one person in front of the other. As it moves forward, the person in front of you is going to go first to help you remember. Ten is relinquish. <coughs> And relinquish means to give up. Um, and usually you're giving something up of value. Um, something, you know, relinquish, it's almost like you don't want to give it up, but oh, you finally do. And so a lot of times I think of this as relinquishing a, a toy when you're talking about little kids who don't really like to share. And some of us adults don't really like to share either. Um, but you don't want to relinquish whatever it is that that other person wants. Um, and when you think of politics, you know, people not wanting to relinquish control and Wars have been started and fought because of that. And so I have a picture of two little boys, and one is relinquishing one of his little marbles. He's giving it up. I'm sure it's hard for him to do, but he's doing it anyway. Eleven, that other little boy, you know, if he was like snatching it out of his hand, he might be seizing it. And to seize is a verb. It means to catch or take hold of something suddenly and kind of forcibly, so with some force behind it. Um, so if you grab something out of someone's hand, if you seize something off a table, it means you, you kind of grab hold of it very quickly um, and with a lot of energy or force. And to seize almost has, you know, in the in the past, you know, rulers would seize land. They would take it by force. Um, it has, it's kind of one of those words that has some interesting connotations around it. And here's kind of a silly photo of a woman kind of trying to grab something from this gentleman. Um, I'm not really sure who's seizing it, but there's definitely some kind of power struggle happening. Supercilious. And someone who is described as supercilious is very, like, haughty very, you know, high and mighty. They think a lot of themselves and they probably don't think a whole lot about you. They tend to have what, you know, considered like careless contempt. They have contempt for you. They, who are you? Why are you here? Um, so I have this picture of this older woman with her penciled in eyebrows who looks a little haughty, a little supercilious, like clearly she's kind of looking down her nose at you. Thirteen is trite, and trite describes uh, a phrase usually or something, but it tends to refer to like phrases, um, like cliches are very trite, um, but they're things that are made kind of commonplace by frequent repetition. So a lot of times in students' writing, students will use, you'll use really trite language, you know, like sayings that you hear over and over again in life, and so they kind of come naturally as you write, but unfortunately they kind of do not elevate, they don't bring your essay up, they kind of drag it down because they're, they sound repetitive, they're things we've already heard, they don't, they don't sound like new original ideas. So actually in your writing, you want to avoid sounding trite, you want to avoid using cliches or those those phrases that we have all heard a million times. Um, but anything that's described as trite has just been made very common, commonplace by frequent repetition. So the phrase, all's well that ends well, um, you'll hear this all the time, and it's a very trite phrase, it's a very trite expression. Eclectic. I love this word. As somebody or something that's described as eclectic um, selects from or chooses from a variety of different things. And this definition is very much an SAT definition. They say, selecting or choosing from a variety of systems, objects, methodologies, not following one system. Um, someone who's eclectic has like a really diverse 
diverse collection of something, a very diverse um, kind of spectrum of interests. And so probably the best way to describe someone who's eclectic, who doesn't have just one interest or style or passion, they kind of take a little bit from here and a little bit from there and they bring it all together in a bit of a kind of like a hodgepodge of things which they are interested in or which they um, collect. And so I have this picture of this room and this person definitely feels a little eclectic. Um, the, the, the artwork is from different um, art movements. The, the materials, the rug and the comforter, everything kind of doesn't match, but it's kind of got this funky, um, maybe indie style about it. And so here we have someone who is clearly eclectic with her style, her furniture, her artwork, someone who has an eclectic music collection. I would consider myself to have a fairly eclectic music selection. Um, might have, you know, dance tracks mix, mixed with rap, mixed with country, mixed with, you know, whatever's on the top 40 list right now. So just having a bunch of different music types might make you kind of um, an eclectic person when it comes to your musical selection or your musical library. And then the last word is foliage. Totally different from the other words. It's a noun and it means leaves of a plant that are kind of together in a clump and create this greenery. Um, so foliage is greenery and like lush green leaves of a plant. So I have an example of that.